Um, welcome to this Horasis Asia meeting on months of education lost to COVID-19. Uh, my name is Alejandro Reyes. I'm the moderator for this session. I am the Director of Knowledge Dissemination at the Asia Global Institute at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, with us are a wonderful panel of uh, six experts. Uh, let me just very quickly introduce them. Divya Lau, who's coming in from Delhi, who's founder and managing director of FlipLearn, which is an award-winning e-learning app designed to supplement child, ch children learning, uh, child learning with the help of fun and interactive digital content. Also from India is Sushma Paul Berlia, who's coming in from Dubai, and she's the president of APJ uh, Group, which is a um, leading uh, education uh, group uh, in India. And uh, she's also a, a leading woman entrepreneur and industrialist in India. Joining us from Switzerland, although he's uh, usually in Washington, I believe, uh, Adrian Mutton, uh, who's founder and CEO of Sanam S4. Uh, in 2008, Adrian moved to Delhi to establish uh, Sanam S4, with his aim being to provide a fit-for-purpose support platform for businesses and universities and nonprofit seeking to explore and enter exp and expand into India. Uh, from Jakarta, uh, we have um, Dr. Uh, Gerald Arif, who's co-founder and chief partnership officer at harukaedu.com, and uh, which is Indonesia's leading higher education online learning and career platform. Um, and all the way in Canada, from Edmonton, Alberta, is Manfred Zeich, who's uh, vice president external affairs and international relations at Concordia University of Edmonton, a very cold place um, in, in the world right now. And uh, lastly, uh, we have uh, Michaela Notari from Bern, who's professor um, at the Pädagogische Hochschule Bern, at the University of Teacher Education in Bern, Switzerland. So thank you very much, colleagues. It's wonderful to see you um, and uh, virtually. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's a, it, this is a very appropriate topic because we are virtual and education has had to go virtual for the most part around the world. Indeed, in Hong Kong now, because of spikes that we've had here, uh, uh, some schools have closed and students have had to go back to the virtual uh, uh, world. Uh, so I want to start with Divya and ask you about the challenges posed uh, in the K-12 to segment in India, of which you are uh, familiar. Uh, so please, uh, Divya, please tell, tell us a bit about the experience in India and what you perceive about the education lost as well. We, we'll talk about the education lost, but of course, the whole idea is what is the education that we regain or that we uh, uh, how, how we um, recapture uh, the, the, the education and learning that, that might have been lost over the several months. So Divya, please. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, I think uh, in India, Schools have been shut since 20th March 2020, and we are almost looking at the ninth month now, going into 10 months of really uh, no schools uh, and children not really coming. But this has not been really as dark as it seems because this has been a watershed moment for the Indian education system as far as adoption of technology has been there. I think. Um, all educators across India stood up in one voice to prove that India will learn no matter what. We've seen educators with their own very, very constrained means and resources to go online, uh, learn new platforms to connect to their students. And the initial long lockdown of about 100 days plus when the parents were also at home also enabled the access to devices in some form and shape. We do understand India is a very diverse country, a country that spreads across in different socioeconomic patterns. And that is why there have been some amazing initiatives taken by the Indian government to reach out to children who don't have access to data or whose teachers don't have access to any kind of a smart device to actually beam themselves. Uh, we saw state governments get into WhatsApp groups and actually send learning material to children and one is to five ratio with every teacher connecting to five, five students and hence making a chain ahead or to take up channels on the national um, state uh, television, which are completely dedicated to only education and teachers coming and teaching 
or to have programs on the radio to reach out. I think in India, it's been a stupendous effort. Now, when you look at an effort versus impact and the challenge, there have been many, okay? But it is the heartfelt piece is that at least there has been a huge amount of impact. Yesterday, a few days back, I was in conversation with a very senior government official with one of the biggest uh, boards in education that actually certifies children after grade 10. And they said 80% of the children have been connected to learning which governs a very large segment of the Indian education children that are there. So I feel, yes, there have been challenges. It has been unprecedented in India to teach children uh, without a face-to-face -face interface and something that we are not used to even in a day-to-day -day life pre-COVID era. But the spirit that has come across has been that we will reach out and go beyond our own comfort zone and also is now breaking barriers in how we are perceiving India of the next century to be. Alejandro, you are on mute. Uh, you are on mute, Alexander. You are on mute. Sorry, the button keeps on disappearing. So I was searching for the button. So thank you very much, Divya. Uh, may I just remind um, our uh, viewers uh, that uh, you can ask questions through the comment box. Uh, so please do that. And we'll get to questions uh, as soon as we do a couple of rounds with our panelists. So uh, Sushma, uh, please, uh, what are your views on, uh, on, on, on what's going on in India? So I would briefly like to make five quick points to begin with. First, just to add on to what Divya said, the actual fact, if you see on the ground, of course, there has been cutting edge response. Uh, you know, for schools like ours, we were able to immediately get onto the platforms virtually engage with the students, look at multimodal ways of connecting. And one could even have ex proctored examinations, functions, activities. We even attempted sports through virtual learning. But on the other hand of the spectrum, you had smaller schools who couldn't cope up or actually went down because the salaries anywhere as far as private schools were concerned were not supported by anybody else. So a lot of schools actually had to close their shutters and one wonders what happened to those students. Then in terms of public institutions and schools, though, as Divya said, that a lot of attempt was made, including through national television and other places. But the fact of the matter remains that there is still a kind of a doubt as to how much learning has actually taken place on the ground. As she said, no lack of effort, but what has happened? The other big concern is a whole lot of migrant labor who left the cities at that time and went back to their villages and to other places. And they are kind of lost at the moment. And I think there has to be a huge effort taken to find out that what's actually happening on the ground and how to bring back those students into the national learning platform. It's possible. And I, we can talk about it when we look at the solutions to some of the challenges that have been faced. Uh, higher education actually um, has had a very friendly regulatory response in the sense that they were very, the regulatory framework was very, very flexible to different modes of blending learning, which they would like to adopt. And again, uh, if we see, they were mixed responses because we had private sector and some of the public sector institutions like IITs and IIMs who could quickly get onto the platforms. And for instance, at APJ, we experienced a huge exponential learning actually because we actually discovered the inter-institutional joys of sharing of learning, best practices, ability to engage better with industry and uh, reach out in a far more interactive way. 
But on the other hand, you also had public universities, which do have huge number of students going to them, which were unable to even do some kind of virtual learning. And in addition to that, the other issues have been that a lot of students, either because of affordability, did not actually seek admissions this year in many of the higher ed institutions, or because a lot of them felt that the education they would get would not give them sufficient value and actually chose to drop out. Of course, they have been admissions and colleges have taken classes, but you also have a lot of delays in admissions. You have a lot of delays in examinations around the country. I mean, again, some of the institutions, as I mentioned, including ours at APJ, we were able to really conduct huge amount of online examinations, assessments, and even actually conduct graduation. But especially in higher education, if you see, apart from the advantages, the issues have been really um, on being able to ensure the conduction of syllabi in time, in a manner, and in the interactive manner, and exposure to industry, to hands-on learning, and all kinds of things, internship, projects, which have really suffered along the way despite best efforts uh, to make it happen, which one wonders how it will actually translate down the line. Modes of learning has been very interesting because we've actually realized the importance of uh, teacher engagement on the virtual mode. And I think in many cases, post-COVID, I think the good institutions are not going to go back to the old normal. They are actually going into the new normal where you get into some kind of blended learning. But still the challenges of lost students, of lost education because of truncated syllabi, although many attempts have been made to ensure that the essential components have not been lost, and the fact that ultimately education is not just about learning um, and impartation of knowledge, but goes beyond that in terms of interactivity as well as really learning beyond the classroom. And to what extent we can successfully duplicate this in the next few months, because despite the vaccine, we are not really sure if India would be able to open up in the way that it could and should open up its educational institutions. We need to remember that for most institutions, it's really not going to be physically possible to move into effective uh, uh, physical education with the social distancing mode based on density, based on means, based on so many other things. So we are looking at many more months of the situation apart from the challenge of reaching out to those who currently are lost in the educational system. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Sushma. In fact, uh, it just makes me think about uh, educators that I know, including a brother of mine, um, who were teaching in hybrid systems. And they. I, I have yet to hear anybody say that hybrid, where there's some physical and some online, that that was working. They either wanted it all physical, if that was possible, or all online. The hybrid just would have, have I, I, no fans of the hybrid. So, um, Adrian, uh, I'm wondering if you could provide further insight into the Indian experience, which you're quite familiar. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alejandro. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to build on, on Divya and Sushma's points. And I'd like to start by just putting that into context for our audience. India, of course, is an enormous education um, environment. There are 1.4 million students in secondary higher education and uh, 600 million of the population are under the age of 25. And 28% of the population is under the age of 14. So it's a, it's a significant amount of uh, students whose needs need to be attended to. And of course, what the pandemic has done has thrown that system um, uh, up into the air. And, and as Sushma and Divya have quite rightly said, put uh, challenges on it in a way that I don't think the, the education system has, has ever seen. Also, to balance the context, um, as Sushma says, the schools have been 
remote learning since March. Uh, my three children uh, are all educated in Washington, D.C. Their experience has been entirely online since March as well. And I know that the U.S. higher, edu uh, US higher and um, public school and private education systems are struggling through the pandemic. India's scale, um, certainly a higher education, is one that uh, I think is, is, is certainly outside of China unrivaled with a thousand universities and 52,000 colleges. And many of those have just not been equipped to deal with the, um, the, the pandemic evolving in the way that it has done. I think many of the faculty have been used to delivering a traditional uh, class-based learning environment. Of course, um, the students have been used to coming into school and that's been their sanctuary of learning. And so the pandemic has thrown up these enormous challenges. And I think uh, both Sushma and Divya have given a very good account of those challenges and the realities around the learning experience. And certainly there have been uh, campus-based challenges where, of course, um, the faculty have just not been equipped to deliver a remote learning experience. But also domestically, we must remember that India is fairly unique, that it has a multi-family housing unit. Many people, uh, and I know this just through my working colleagues, do not have the space in the house to have a dozen members of the family all of a sudden using the same Wi-Fi, using video at the same time, and being able to have productive uh, engagement online with every other member of the family still trying to, to work remotely as well as uh, other siblings learn remotely. So I think there have been tremendous practical challenges um, that India has, has uniquely faced through the pandemic. Out of the pandemic, however, India has had this enormous jolt to the system and I think this in the long term will hopefully be proven as a unique opportunity for the disruption of education throughout the, the ages to actually benefit India, although it's difficult to see that in the short term. In terms of the technology advancement, I think Divya and, and Sushma have given very good examples of how technology has accelerated very, very rapidly. The distribution of learning has certainly increased to give people who never had the ability to go online and learn uh, before. That's certainly accelerated through the pandemic. The cost of learning as a result of that has come down there are, however, still major challenges around content distribution uh, across the country. We at Sanam S4 have certainly been in touch with several state governments about supporting the distribution of, of high quality, high caliber content through the higher education system in particular. So this innovation through technology has certainly accelerated. I think the distribution of content and the ability to serve that content live um, uh, to make sure there is a blend of synchronous and asynchronous learning is going to be uh, a continued challenge in India and the rest of the world. But also, and, and I think it's worth noting at the outset of this conversation, what this has spurred is the greatest reform in India's education system um, for a generation. The national education policy was announced over the summer in India. Uh, of course, there's been a lot of work building uh, up to the announcement pre-pandemic. But to see a national education policy be announced, be resourced during a pandemic, I think gives us all hope for how India can emerge out of the pandemic crisis, uh, well equipped and well placed to actually um, take advantage of the enormous practical and real challenges that the pandemic has thrown up for Indian learners. Thanks very much, Adrian. I mean, this brings to mind that old dictum that in a crisis you should search out for opportunity and uh, don't waste a, 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 a good or a bad crisis and, 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 and do something to, to make change. Now I'm going to go uh, shift to another uh, developing economy, another big one in Southeast Asia to, to Gerald Arif in uh, Jakarta. Please, Gerald, could you give us uh, your thoughts on uh, the uh, situation in Indonesia, underscoring any differences that you've heard from our colleagues from, who are familiar with India that you want to highlight. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, so basically, we face the same challenges as uh, our colleagues in, in India, Divya, Suswant, Adrian, uh, but this basically is exacerbated uh, further because a lot of our uh, population are distributed over thousands of islands, 
uh, and basically those islands, especially in the eastern part of Indonesia, with much lower population concentration, uh, have been experiencing very, very bad uh, study experience. Uh, myself, I live in Jakarta uh, with the capital city. I have two children who also has been full online uh, in terms of their learning. And I fully shared what Adrian uh, stated. Uh, even in my household, we are constantly fighting over the broadband. My son, who's 10 years old, always complaining. He's going to kill me if I don't change the mobile internet provider. Uh, and I, I've done that, but it's still a, a problematic. And this is in the capital city in Jakarta, right? Uh, a World Bank study uh, last week actually sh found that 44% of all K-12 schools in Indonesia do not have internet connection. 44%. I mean, that's huge, right? Uh, and myself at Haruka Edu, we work with universities and training providers to deliver online as well as blended learning courses. Uh, and that has been a big opportunity uh, as Flipkart probably experienced. Uh, we've been evangelizing to everyone, go online, go online, go online. And finally, everybody has to go full online overnight. Uh, but again, the comment that Adrian said, content is a big challenge. Many are not familiar. What is good content? Just a PowerPoint, just a video that lasts for two hours that nobody wants to watch. Uh, so these, these things are very, very challenging for us uh, as an island nation. Uh, but our government is also trying very hard to make the appropriate regulation whilst prioritizing safety. So we are still in our first wave and many people are continuing to get sick and dying. Um, and now because the re response of the central government is saying no more schools, no more universities on campus online, despite having this 44% having no internet connection, obviously everybody started to complain, right? Uh, it's not so easy to have good mobile internet access uh, and it's not so easy to afford if, even if they have mobile internet access. So even in South Jakarta, we have some leading schools who have problems in serving their students uh, to continue their education in uh, high school level. So this is a constant, consistent problem, but we see that as an opportunity, but I think Again, it's the affordable gap between the suburbs and the rural areas. Uh, and our finding from our students that we serve, a lot of them actually prefer blended learning, not only full online, but they want to meet their friends. They want to meet their professors on campus, even though once a week or once a month in order to have that physical interaction. So I think it's a huge opportunity, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Thanks very much. Uh, this reminds me of a time when we had the uh, protests in Hong Kong, uh, not last year, but uh, in 2014. And I had to teach um, physically, but also ensure that students who couldn't come to class could could view. And, and you know, the content is very important. You often don't think about it, but just videotaping a lecture. I mean, you can watch my lectures and they're very bad. The production value is just awful. And, uh, you know, I can't imagine the students who were watching that. I mean, they would uh, learn all that much. Now, Manfred, uh, we, we, uh, we're moving to Canada. And um, what is your perspective as an academic leader of a university there? And how might that the experience that you are seeing, uh, how, how might that be similar or different from what we heard so far from our Indian and uh, Indonesian colleagues? Thank you, Alejandro. I hope you can hear me well. Um, it is quite similar, uh, you know, to be honest here, uh, um, I am at the university that is a small independent university uh, going to be 100 years next year, um, publicly funded by independent, uh, part of the uh, Alberta learning system here. And in Alberta, uh, we have, uh, of course, uh, K-12 to um, is more um, ill-equipped uh, as, as post-secondaries, but also we have, in rural Alberta, we have problems with... Uh, with remote learning. And um, so uh, when in March, my university, uh, all of our universities uh, went to, to, to the quarantine, um, some, some took a couple of days off to prepare uh, the online delivery. And uh, my small university, it's a small university, decided to do it uh, from night to day. 
um, and start the next day in online, all the, all the professors. So um, traditionally, we have not been very enthusiastic for um, any online delivery at Concordia. Uh, we value the face-to-face -face experience, the community, the small university boutique experience, the personal experience of the students with, with all. And um, so Moodle, basic Moodle was what, what some knew and that's it. Uh, we have come a long way since March and the professors, they did not complain. I mean, the professors, they were all, of, all the way, they were supporting the, the decisions of the administration in handling that. And they were also, as you talked about here, yeah, let's do an effort and learn. Uh, that that was seen here too. Um, this was an interesting thing. Another thing that we have learned is that the takeaways from from this situation, and the technology that that we are learning, um, are that, um, for instance, uh, we have a center for Chinese studies that uh, that provides, among other things, um, training for Chinese teachers in North America, in Europe, and in China. Um, so China, we, we receive groups in the summer, um, uh, under 100 uh, normally. Uh, we had over 1,000 this year in the summer. We were able to reach over 1,000 students in, in Europe and in North America, although the numbers of new registrations for, for next uh, fall are going down in Alberta and also at Concordia a little bit because of the uncertainty of what will happen. But there is there is a possibility of reaching more people. The other thing I would like to say is about, if uh, just a minute more, is that uh, about lost time of, 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 uh, of Asian um, constituencies, um, uh, lost time of, of learning and, and so forth. What we have learned here is that the blend is really, and the, um, the hybrid is really a good thing going forward. And um, the, for instance, what was the traditional classroom um, mostly content delivery. And you didn't get your PhD because you have people skills, it's because you have some knowledge. Um, so uh, the pre-recorded, pre-recorded asynchronous is, is, is the way to go for students who have a poor connection, can make up the time, they lose the connection, but they don't lose the content and leave the time for synchronous class to do the, um, the interaction and learning by, um, uh, learning by by doing by solving problems. I want to come back on this here uh, a little bit later on on the on the model that we are thinking of going forward. But that I would say at the beginning. Great, thanks very much. If, if I could just a quick follow up, Manfred, because you're uh, part of the administration of a university. What about the issue of lost income and budgetary um, uh, shortfalls uh, for many higher education institutions as a result of the situation? Yes, that's a good question. Uh, we, we, uh, the current government in Alberta has announced um, a refurbishing of the system, uh, complete, and also cuts. So there were cuts uh, to the universities. There is a downside in the, in the um, uh, income uh, low fr from the drop of students for the next term, right? I mean, the next the, the, the fall next year. Um, this, each university will have to deal with. Uh, Concordia, particularly here, my, my small university, um, has been experiencing very, I mean, steady uh, financial situation so that we are not, we are not needing to, to, to lay off, you know, people and, and, and to, to restructure um, here. So this is a good thing. But we are, of course, thinking of uh, investing more even in, in human resources to do more recruitment because international students are a little bit going down. Uh, we had pre-COVID 18% international students, which is high for Alberta. Um, we are a little bit down. So we are investing actually in hiring more for doing more recruitment. So it, 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 it go, uh, and then the, the large public universities, they have, of course, we have heard of many that have laid off Hundreds, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people in Alberta. So it's a problem, yeah? So, Great. Uh, yeah. 
Th yeah, thanks very much. Um, if I can now turn to Michaela uh, in, in Switzerland. Uh, Michaela, you teach teachers, basically. So uh, what are your views on, I, I, I think you, you, you basically focus on skills learning. And um, yes, well, thank you. Well, yeah, I'm teaching teacher in Switzerland. That's one part of my job. I'm teaching students in Hong Kong. That's the second part of my job. I'm following up projects in Sumatra. That's the third part of my job. And I'm following up also projects in in uh, the Philippines, so where I have also a bit of coverage of uh, all the situation, the possible situation in Sumatra, while the coverage of the technology is very low, which means, as uh, we heard before, uh, just many schools don't have e e internet and not, no, the kids don't have any, any devices. And then going to the Philippines, which is a similar stage, where I had my, my teachers telling me that they, they, they want printers, during the pandemic because they have to print out the textbooks and deliver them by motorbike. On the other hand, I have Hong Kong and Switzerland where you have a quite almost uh, totally coverage of technology and, uh, and uh, bandwidth where so the students have no technological problem or no connection problems. So that's the thing, the, the, the bandwidth we deal with, and that's one of the big issues, of course, trying to... Uh, provide this uh, access and trying to provide the technology which allows the access. So I will give you a little bit of uh, perspective from the pedagogical point of view, what is really relevant, what has been lost and what is uh, to, to take care of. And actually some points have been mentioned already by the speaker before. You know, if you need to have, of course, content delivery, which is um, uh, not only correct, but also in a way that really can be um, absorbed by the students. And on the other hand, you know, um, you cannot deliver learning, you cannot deliver competencies, you can just deliver information. And that's the point which is really uh, like a striking point. You can have all the information, you had it already before, you know, you had all these MIT courses, all this, so many universities with delivered high standard, high quality content, but that is not learning. Learning is another thing, and especially what about competences are we talking about? If it comes to, you know, skills and competences, one is factual knowledge or procedural knowledge. Factual knowledge, you can learn facts, and that's very easy to be transmitted by information delivery. But on the other hand, like skills which are relevant for surviving, like communication, like co collaboration, like conflict resolution, like negotiation, really uh, skills which are much easier taught in a presential um, environment where you have synchronous and presential environment. And this is one thing, whatever the technology uh, allows, um, the, the, the relevance of or the, the easiness of transmission of um, information um, is much easier than, than it's, it's easier to transmit information than to, to build up the skills. I, the, the last ones I was talking about, like communication, interaction, uh, conflict resolution. And actually, if we are talking about the loss, which has been in the last couple months in COVID, if you have connectivity, then you certainly lose a lot of skills, which are actually related to really collaboration, um, uh, negotiation, conflict resolution, things that happens actually normally in a classroom environment, especially um, on the um, uh, K-12 level, but also should happen at the university level because actually we have to um, empower our students also at higher education with these skills because these skills are the ones which are used and demanded for the uh, work uh, working environment. So that's the thing. If we are talking from the pedagogical point of view, the loss is actually in very important skills which are not really covered by the pure information transmission. And of course, it has been mentioned by many, by most of you, all your the speakers before. The the blended approach is one which is actually fostering a bit more the the way we could um, really um, build upon the skills which are relevant also for work use and so. So it's not really, it's a long way and especially we have to be very careful about what happens after COVID if we, we uh, by, by this coverage of um, if the, the internet is available and the technology, by giving uh, importance to all this information delivery and say, yeah, we can learn, everything is here, it's online, but actually something will be missing and something very relevant will be missing for the future generations of the workforce. And that is one thing we have to be aware now, because it's, it happens already, but also in post-COVID. So, um, so that's actually the thing I would like to point out uh, on that um, topic. 
for the yes. moment. Yes, thanks very much. Uh, just a quick uh, uh, follow up. Do you think technology can ever uh, um, mitigate that that lack of ability to uh, foster those kinds of skills? Yes, actually, there are some concept pedagogical concepts where technology can be used or can be can foster a bit better uh, the um, this uh, the the skills I was mentioning about. So, like collaboration, communication. There is like a really big big research area in the computer supported collaborative learning in how to negotiate, how to um, um, do problem solving online. There are many many concepts from the pedagogical point of view, but actually, it's a bit more complex. It's a bit more complicated. And if you look at the e-learning um, e learning world nowadays, you have uh, like the MOOCs and all the things you have, like sort of a, a co content delivery, sometimes some question and answer in forums and assessment. That's e-learning, how it is understood today. And there are many, many other concepts which really foster much more the interaction, the negotiation, the collaboration, the communication, and this um, these elements, the... It's a bit diff more difficult to, to set up, and it's actually it uses a bit more manpower to sustain. So that means it costs, it's more cost relevant, but it forces a bit more. But still, it cannot replace the face to face uh, synchronous education. Great, thank you. Now, Sushma, uh, you wanted to intervene, and also, I, you know, if you can also talk about um, some of the disruptions and what you think maybe in the long term where India might be heading. Um, yes, well, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to say that therefore, listening to all the panelists here, I just wanted to share that very early on, we recognized the criticality of teacher education. And funnily enough, beyond that in schools, really at the higher ed level, and I'm talking even now during the pandemic, when we were responding by a virtual education, because it meant that though we went online immediately, but, you know, all those challenges came to fore and not every teacher was really equipped to be able to leave alone, handle technology well, but also to be able to utilize technology in delivering a more engaging content. And unlike a classroom, the students might just drop out. They could say, well, you know, the net wasn't working, but a lot of cases it could be just that the teacher was not able to engage the students. And therefore, I think there is going to be a big, big room and place for, uh, you know, uh, just training our teachers and actually much more the higher education teachers who in India as well are far more used to a lecture mode as opposed to uh, interactive beyond a point. We've experimented with a lot of things. And uh, to answer Mikhail, yes, it's definitely possible. And, we, uh, you know, there are interesting ways of doing it, but it can't be done without use of more complex technology and effective training uh, on the ground. Yeah, I totally agree with the two points, the teacher point and the other thing that... Um, um, it's more complex to uh, achieve this uh, this goal to foster the other skills like yeah the one I was mentioning before yeah totally agree. and then on the front of the disruption <coughs> what it has actually brought into place some very important issues because India has always been struggling about access to good quality education particularly in the remote areas. I think this has given us a sort of a leap ahead, if you will, to be able to take into account all the learnings that came through this kind of an engagement and all that efforts that have been made at the government level, at the private sector level. And we need to remember that the government could figure out how to transfer cash to the cash transfer scheme to the remotest areas of the country. So they could utilize that connect and in conjunction with the local councils and the, you know, the local governments to actually be able to translate this into much more effective education, partially driven by technology. It can never replace face to face learning, of course. Having said that, this disruption, as uh, you know, was mentioned, um, we uh, have now bought in the new education policy 2020. It's very visionary, a lot of transformation is involved in the process. And I actually think that particular challenge has now been bridged because of the disruptions that took place right now. 
uh, on the Indian education front, particularly at the higher education level. Uh, just the fact that people had to rethink about education at large and the modes of delivery, as well as having sufficient institutions out there, uh, has put us on a path to a faster implementation of this vision, which I think is critical for India in times to come. Thanks very much. Now, Divya, can you uh, talk a bit about the uh, long-term impact of uh, what you see? Yeah. Uh, quick two, three points, uh, uh, Alexandro. First, I think a lot of people are trying to compare engagement with no reference point to how was engagement behind closed doors inside a classroom. Okay. So people say children are rocking out and, you know, they're not connected. Uh, when you talk about technology and platforms, and I have a platform that is used by more than half a million kids in India across uh, some 300, 500 schools. So uh, to give you a very good sense on what we are looking at is it is not black versus white. It is not face to face versus an online space. But I think with the new education policy also pushing for children, the choices of subjects in grade 11, 12, uh, opening up uh, any barriers to a stream of science versus arts versus commerce. Uh, you are looking at systems that will enable you to share high quality educators across various schools and across various spreads to actually make it practical and bring the policy. So I think we're looking for blended learning. Very important third thing, India is defined by 180 or 210 calendar days as far as the schooling K-12 system is concerned. I think now we are re-questioning the fact on, you know, every time there's a cold wave, the school's shut. Every time there is a heat wave, the school's shut. Every time there is any kind of a disruption, the education and the K-12 segment takes a hit. But what the pandemic has taught India is that really you can actually continue in a digital model and actually evolve a system that enables you lesser disruption, more time to evolve. And just going back to one more point where we talked about the skills, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take 10, 20 seconds, um, is the fact that, you know, there are a lot of skills needed even on an online platform. You know, just to get five people together to actually discuss is a lot of collaboration, a lot of negotiation that you're putting, including the negotiation at home for bandwidth and for video calling and for some silence, if nothing else. So there are different things that are evolving and we have to appreciate the situation we are in. Okay, back to you, Alex. Great. Thanks very much. I don't know what happens when we run out of time, but I, I, I'm assuming we can still go on a little bit. Uh, Adrian, just quickly, uh, in terms of the quantum shifts in higher learning that you want to talk about. Yeah, I, I think what we're going to see on the back of this pandemic, as Sushma has quite rightly articulated and Divya is already experiencing through her platform, is a significant expansion of access of learning, which I think is a really, really important uh, upside, frankly, to the pandemic longer term from India. When I look at that from an international perspective, I, I do agree with Manfred and uh, Mikhail that you can't replace the social side of engagement. Uh, all of the skills that you learn through a, an international learning experience are particularly valuable and will continue to remain so to international students. Uh, but what this pandemic will do in the wider distribution and greater access of, of good learning content by driving down the price, the access will not only be wider, but it would also be more affordable to Indian students. And typically you've got a half a million Indian students who are studying overseas. When you bring that price point down, you open up types of learning collaboration globally that were just never feasible before. So I do think there's an opportunity, and as Sushma says, as part of the national education policy that was announced over the summer, to significantly expand international uh, learning collaboration in the Indian higher education system to the benefit of both Indian students, but also uh, the world and its ability to uh, reach out and engage with, with India too. Great, thank you. Now, Gerald, a, a last sort of closing words from you, and we'll try to fit in Manfred and Michaela before closing. And thanks to you guys for answering Dirk's question. I appreciate that. Okay, uh, so basically, just to answer the topic of challenges, I fully agree with all the panelists. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges that we found in Indonesia is sustainability of the institutions because the financing aspect of the students in being able to afford to pay for the school fees is a big challenge. 
So that's going to basically uh, result in many, many institutions disappearing because they don't know how to adapt and they don't know how to uh, upgrade themselves in this online learning. Back to you, Alejandro. Great. Um, Manfred, a uh, word from you. Um, as I say, I don't know what happens when we run out of time, whether we all turn into pumpkins. But Manfred, uh, please. Yeah, thank you. Very quick. Just thank you for all for your, your presence here and for this conversation. Um, uh, talking about technology, Concordia is really looking um, forward to, to, to new, new horizons in blendings. But we established uh, Concordia TV. And this TV is not the regular TV. It's, uh, it's um, a Netflix style thing. It's the public space.com. And uh, we have uploaded. So this is very interesting, very new. So the, the professors can upload pre, uh, uh, the content delivery there. And I think in the future, we can use the Concordia TV uh, blended with the on, on campus um, um, experiences in solving problems and developing the social skills. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. And a final word from Michaela in Switzerland. So, first of all, thank you very much for letting me be here. The final word is actually going this way. Of course, uh, all, is, all, all uh, educators are aware of the importance of interaction and uh, communication.